Uh, want to welcome to the show right now, however, from uh, Bearing Arms, Mr. Bob Owens. Bob, how are you, sir? Doing wonderful today. How are you doing, sir? I am excellent. Thanks for coming on the program. Uh, made it into the L.A. Times, my friend. Congratulations. I see that. That's uh, and and basically a first, they kind of just took your post. You know, I mean, they just kind of. I mean, really, they could have just run your column. Uh, but would have been know, less they, snarky towards the NRA. But you know, well, you know, they they don't want to give any page views to anybody else, obviously. <laughs> So this, uh, this, this, this columnist uh, uh, says, even the NRA scoffs at right-wing fears of feds hoarding ammo. And he points uh, to your piece, because you did a piece at uh, Bearing Arms where you get into the actual ammo. Because, again, there's uh, a lot of concerns. You'll see the headlines, DHS orders 8.7 billion rounds of ammo. Uh, and, aha, that's where all the ammo is going. That's why I can't find it on the shelf, because the government is buying it all up because they want to make it hard for gun owners to get uh, ammunition since they can't get gun control through Congress. that That's the theory. Um, but you say the reality is that the Obama administration is actually buying less ammunition than, than previous administrations? Uh, it is. It's, it's been going down over the last couple of years. And uh, what people are doing is that there are different documents that go out. And to make a long story short and, and, and as simple as I can, the government will sit here and write a spec saying we want to buy up to this amount of ammunition and then put that out there to all the possible vendors and see who's going to make the best deal. Uh, you know, Offer them the service they need at, at the price they want to pay. It does not mean that they will buy everything on that spec. So they could say that we want $20 million over five years or up to twenty million over five years, and people just assume that, hey, they they're going to buy twenty million rounds. No, it's up to. The reality may be far far less than that, and so people have gotten the wrong information uh, by taking the the maximum amount and assuming that that is the actual amount. Okay. Um, so again, the actual amounts um, uh, much less, and so that okay. So the next part of this, then, Bob, is so where the heck is all the ammo? Uh, in your gun safe, Cam. <laughs> not <laughs> okay. Some of it's in mine, but not all of it's <laughs> in mine. I promise you. Yeah, I mean, what, um, no. It, this is what you're, but what you're saying is it's it's all of us. It's the it's the consumers. It is. I mean, the U.S. military has a dedicated ammunition supply. It does not come from our civilian supply, and it seems like a lot of people don't know that. Uh, as far as the federal government, they are a drop in the proverbial bucket, whether it's D DHS, FBI, or anybody else. The vast majority of it is going to folks like you and I. Uh, people have to remember that you know, prior to the run-up in the 2008 election and then right after Obama got elected, a lot more people started buying guns. A lot more people started shooting guns. And the guns that they were typically buying, uh, most of your new shooters are shooting semi-automatic pistols and semi-automatic rifles. And they have discovered that, lo and behold, these are fun guns that chew up a lot of ammunition relatively quickly. You know, 50 years ago, when folks were mainly shooting bolt actions, they may shoot you know, 20 to 40 rounds at the range and call it good because that's all your shoulder could stand. Today, most of the cartridges people are shooting are either rimfire or intermediate caliber or pistol caliber, and folks are shooting 200 rounds in a range trip. And so manufacturers are pumping out just as much as they can, but we're buying it faster than they can manufacture it. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, and you know, again, the 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 great uh, gun and you know ammunition uh, buying spree of uh, 2013 was really like nothing else the industry has ever gone through. Um, and and you know, when it's when it's a hundred year flood like that, um, it takes some time to recover. What are you hearing in terms of uh, in terms of a, a, a recovery day? Because it's not that all of a sudden things are you know we're going to wake up one day and ba ba the ammo's back. Uh, it's going to be a slow process. Well, it is, and then you know, there are some external factors that go in, go into it as well. Um, you know, we've had a couple of different ammunition and powder facilities that have 
uh, had some interesting things happen within the last couple of months. PB Claremont, which is the second largest powder supplier in the world, had a catastrophic detonation back in March. And so some of your European manufacturers that are imported here are having a hard time getting powder. Everybody's having a hard time getting brass. Uh, you know, lead is, is not as difficult to get. As long as you've got car batteries floating around, there's always going to be lead. But you know, it's, it's finding the raw materials. It's getting 26 hours of a 24-hour day that's the problem. All these manufacturers that we have are running flat out, and uh, they literally cannot make stuff any faster, and it's hard to find new equipment to purchase to get new manufacturers online. Yep, absolutely. Uh, actually, we were talking uh, when I was down in uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina, talking with the guys who were uh, putting together uh, an ammo uh, uh, company. They've been working on it uh, for a couple of years now, getting ready to start rolling uh, some stuff off the uh, the line here later this later this summer, I think. And, uh, you know, it, there, there are a lot of – I mean, that's the other thing. There are a lot of companies that have seen this need uh, over the last couple of years, but it's not a quick startup. Uh, no, it's not. You, you know, there's all sorts of permitting – the real hard part right now, as I said, was, was getting the powder since it's mostly allocated, uh, especially when you have a major powder manufacturer go down like PB Claremont did. And so you know, trying to get all your ducks in a row is a, is a really daunting task. And it's not that people don't want to manufacture stuff. It's just that every possible uh, machine out there has been put into use, and these things are, are – you know, very large pieces of, of very expensive equipment that are, you know, are, are not something you could run down to Walmart and just, and just buy another one. Absolutely. Um, all right, listen, Bob, while I got you here, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a, a post that uh, you just posted at uh, BearingArms.com um, about this hero in Seattle. And, you know, after after one of these events, uh, the media, uh, in fact, Rasmussen reports this had a uh, poll out today. Forty-five percent of Americans, they say, uh, think the media focuses too much on these killers. Um, mm -hmm. Just thirteen percent said they don't think uh, the media pays enough attention uh, to these killers. I, I think the numbers uh, would probably be reversed if you asked, you know, when there is someone, uh, do we do we know enough about the victims, or do we enough about the uh, know enough about the individuals to help stop the attack? Um, and so you talk at uh, at Bearing Arms about this incredible student uh, and, and teaching assistant, John Mice, um, who actually approached this guy, uh, sprayed him with pepper spray as he was reloading uh, and, and helped subdue him. Other students then joined in and they pinned him to the ground until police arrived. Uh, we've seen a lot of stories calling this guy a hero. And I got to wonder, Bob, how long that's going to last because, as, as you point out, um, not only did uh, Mr. Mice, not only does he uh, support the National Rifle Association on Facebook and uh, numerous uh, uh, firearms manufacturers and retailers, uh, you found a, a, a piece back when he was in high school. Uh, he was the co-founder of the uh, SKAR Airsoft team in, in high school, uh, mm -hmm. which you say uh, competes in simulated combat events. So it, it appears this young man... Uh, as you say, is clinging not bitterly, but rather uh, 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 joyously to his religion uh, and uh, to his firearms, to his guns. Yeah, absolutely. We have a culture that, in, in the media, that would unfortunately rather get bogged down in the psychoses and neuroses of the people who perpetrate these acts. And, you know, there are folks out there who think that it may perpetuate a cycle when they do that, talking about the bad guys, and they don't want to talk about the good guys that help prevent or stop these events. And Mr. Mize here is, you know, if, if you look into the article, uh, some of the stuff I was able to find, you know, you could not ask for a better young man as a role model. You know, a student with an you know, incredible GPA, uh, lots of humanitarian work, uh, for Katrina relief, sending, <coughs> excuse me, stockings to the troops during the holidays. Uh, you know, he he goes to a Christian college. He's very devout. He's you know just a great all-around young guy. It seems like D 
doesn't want the spotlight. He just, you know, wants his privacy and his friends. And uh, and yet, when he was called upon, he stepped up. And he's the kind of person that we need a lot more of in this world, and we need to hear more about young people like this young man. This, this is the kind of, of, of young man that younger generations should be idolizing, not some of these crackpot shooters that get their names in the news for months at a time. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, again, just I, I think – you know, I know the gun control advocates are going to say, and they already have said, I've seen this, Bob, and they say, well, look, this shows uh, you don't need a good guy with a gun. All you need is a good guy with pepper spray. I think I, I think what it shows is you need a good guy. First exactly. and foremost, you need a good guy. You need somebody exactly. who, again, we're talking about inanimate objects, but you need that individual who is prepared to risk his life for others, uh, which is what we had here, and that's what should be honored. And I think gun control advocates and gun owners alike can honor the actions of this man. Absolutely. And, and the interesting thing is, is while he may not have had a gun on him, he had a mindset that is very familiar to a lot of people in our community and perhaps not so much common in a community that seems to thrive on embracing victimhood. So take that for what that's worth. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. Uh, well, listen, Bob, I appreciate you coming on the program, sir, and uh, look forward to doing this again very soon. Absolutely.